Meet the Miyazawa family. And this here is Tokyo, the largest city in Japan. And the Miyazawa family lived just outside of Tokyo, in a suburb, or what's known as a prefecture, named Sadageya. A quiet place where, if we're being honest, not a lot goes on. This is the house right here. And in this house, they will live their lives. And in this house, they will die. Forty-four-year-old marketing manager Mikio Mawazawa and his wife, teacher, forty-one-year-old Yasko, along with their two children, eight-year-old Nina and their son, six-year-old Ray, have been out shopping for the day, preparing for New Year's celebrations. And for all who had interacted with them and witnessed the family that day, there was nothing unusual or out of sorts. After dinner and an evening of watching television, the mother and her two children went to bed just after nine. With the father retiring to his office on the first floor to pay some bills, the Miyazawa family's death clock was now ticking. It is believed that he was in that office when an intruder at the rear of the house climbed a tree and entered into the second floor bathroom, then walked to the six-year-old Ray's bedroom. The child with a learning disability was strangled while he slept. Still downstairs, the father must have heard a commotion. When he walked into the room, he was stabbed with a 12-inch blade that broke off in his head. He would have lived long enough to see that his son was dead. The mother and the daughter, sleeping in the loft, were alerted by the disruption and came down the stairs, but were promptly set upon and both beaten severely, with the daughter having four of her teeth knocked out. What happened next is open to conjecture, but police believe that the intruder went into the kitchen to get another knife after he'd broken his, and the mother went to the bathroom to get tissue to treat her daughter's wounds. And if that wasn't a mistake, her next would be fatal because she returned to the loft to hide. But perhaps realizing her error in judgment, her and her daughter went back down the ladder and in a bid for freedom, headed for the front door. But the intruder was waiting. It was too late. It was 9.30 the next day when the mother-in-law, who lived in the house next door, had attempted the phone and then was knocking on the door. No one answered. Now concerned, she entered the home just after 10 a.m. and was greeted by her dead son-in-law midway down the stairs. Quickly moving up the stairs, she found her daughter and granddaughter dead on the landing. Her grandson, who appeared to be sleeping in his bed, was also dead. She had attempted CPR on the children, but they'd passed. Tokyo's Metropolitan Police arrived at the Miyazawa home at about 10.31. Forensics were quickly able to rule out a sexual motive, but were able to establish that the attack on the females was more brutal and prolonged. Was the killer familiar with the victim or just hate women? And the knife wounds were to the face and the neck, with both the mother and the daughter having over 40 wounds. The father was stabbed several times in the face, but it was a knife that punctured his skull 
and entered his brain that was to kill him. The wound would have caused total paralysis, but he could have lived up to 30 minutes still aware of his surroundings. The son being the only victim not to die by the knife, and was most likely strangled as he slept. But due to the fact he had a learning disability, even if he was conscious, he may not have been cognizant of what was happening to him. When rice-eating cops arrived and entered the house, they were shocked. It looked like a spastic had been playing pin the tail on the donkey with a chainsaw. And this is Japan after all, where littering's a felony. But if they were looking for answers, wasn't as if they didn't have enough evidence to start doing some legwork. Cause the killer left DNA everywhere. Shit in the toilet and hadn't flushed. He'd cut himself and bled out during the attack. Left footprints inside the house and out. And seemed to be in no rush to leave the property. He sat at the father's computer, logged in, even tried to buy concert tickets. Then he took the father's belongings, threw them in a bathtub, fingerprints everywhere. Even ate four bowls of ice cream. And if he were scared of getting caught, he was good at pretending otherwise. But the killer also left some of his belongings, including a fanny pack that had grains of sand in it, and some blood-soaked clothing, including a hat, a shirt, and a jacket. But beside the sand and the fag bag, the shoe prints were interesting, because you couldn't get them in Japan. It was a size only available in South Korea, and the clothes at that time had a distinct skater boy look to them. Seems like our killer would have been the type of guy Avril Lavigne would have liked to bang. And even more interesting, there was a skate park right behind the house. In fact, it was backing out right to where the rice-eating cops believed the killer had entered. And when they did a little poking around, bingo, they discovered the father had a beef with the skate park and complained several times about the noise. He'd also been seen in a confrontation with one of the well-known gangs in the area. But a few unkind words don't add up to someone making you and your family chop suey. And when they ran the blood, it didn't match anyone. And when cops did a background check on the father, he was as straight as a cripple's crutch. He bought the house 10 years earlier when he and his wife decided to settle down and have kids. The only thing that raised a red flag was that a month earlier, the government had given him a $900,000 payoff because they'd been buying out houses in the area. There'd been about 400 of them. Now there were only four, and the Miyazawas and their mother-in-law were one of them. They'd held out for a big payoff, and they got it. Yeah, sure, that's a lot of fish and rice. But is it enough to make a noodlehead kill a family? Seems unlikely. Besides, the money was in the bank, not the house. And they were due to move in a month. And the whole area was going to be turned into a park. A Japanese park. And besides, the cops still believed that the killer was a foreigner. When they started checking out hospitals, they didn't have to look too hard to find something. And only half a mile away, on the morning after the crime, a walk-in was reported with several knife wounds. And surprise, surprise, it was Avril Lavigne's little skater boy. But Japanese hospitals don't need to report knife wounds to cops. And as he was a walk-in, paid in cash, the cops had diddly squat. But it gets more interesting. Early on the morning after the murders, a cab driver said he picked up three individuals in the location of the murder. One of them was a skater boy, and he had a bad wound on his hand. His right hand. But was it the same right-handed man that the hospital treated? Who can say? But I guess there's one thing we can say for sure. He was a goddamn oriental. But it only got stranger. When the police got the report back from the sand found in the fag bag, turns out it was from California. Edwards Air Force Base to be precise. Maybe it was Avril Lavigne's little skater boy. And it appeared that the more the cops found out, the less they knew. But maybe, just maybe, the South Korean running shoot didn't seem so far-fetched now, because in South Korea, there was also an American Air Force base. And maybe the foreigner angle weren't so fucked up as it originally seemed. But when you add the military angle, it just got more confusing. Because why would a skateboarder who was in the US Air Force be climbing in the second story window of a shitter to massacre a Japanese family? It don't make any sense. But there are those critics of the police who say that the skater boy angle is too obvious. Especially since he apparently left his clothes behind. And that the killer didn't seem to be too interested in covering his tracks. 
And maybe if someone wanted to commit a crime and throw off investigators, the perfect way to do it would to be a skater boy, especially with a skate park in the backyard. The ultimate grift. And although the police have constantly been criticized by the public throughout the investigation for not deviating from their foreigner did it stance, if you think about it, maybe their theory isn't so crazy. When forensics had done tests on the clothes left by the skater boy at the crime scene, they discovered that it had been washed in hard water. They only use soft water in Japan, unlike the hard water they use in South Korea. The sand in the fag bag coming from Edwards Andrew Air Base in California were similar US bases in South Korea. So if you think about it, maybe the foreigner angle, it ain't so whack after all.